Twitter came out of nowhere. They became a really huge success. And of course, they built an application or they built an application at the beginning that wasn't designed to handle that kind of scale. I think if I remember correctly, Michael Jackson died in 2009 and Twitter went down. Let's go back in time to the late 2000s, mm -hmm. which is a time that some of us remember well. Mm -hmm. um, and let's talk about Twitter for a second. So All right. Twitter taking the world by a storm, mm -hmm. this fast growing, super uh, scrappy sort of startup mentality and vibe. Um, amazing growth, but also some issues, right? I think if you were around yeah. it on the internet this time, you would remember the Twitter fail whale. The Beluga whale is their 503 hope homepage. When they couldn't load the website, that's when you would see the page. And it almost became a joke because there was a time when it became too frequent. I think if I remember correctly, Michael Jackson died in 2009 and Twitter went down. Then again, Twitter went down during the 2010 World Cup. But by the election night of 2012, Twitter handled that load very well. Never before were humans collaborating with like every penalty kick and every red card and every yellow card in near real time. And typically those conversations were just limited to like a few people sitting in the same room or maybe to the sports bar where you, where you watching where you were watching the game. But now the whole world was commenting on each player's move in real time at a global scale. That hadn't happened Happened before, hadn't happened before. They had a, uh, in terms of technical details, which were, I don't remember all of them, but they had this one monolithic Ruby on Rails app uh, called Monorail. That didn't scale. And, well, then they created many microservices out of it. They created a social graph called Flock, if I remember correctly. And back then, I was in storage. So one fascinating thing they did was they created Manhattan storage, which probably alleviated a lot of their storage problems. They introduced Kafka. And if I remember correctly, their like Ruby on Rails monorail application was then transformed into a Java plus Scala-based application, which was probably the biggest deployment of Scala at that time. So a lot of different engineering solutions, starting from creating stateless front-end servers to heavily, heavily relying on caching to creating a new storage database, all of these things combined together creates the perfect solution. Because if the problem was as easy as like flicking a switch on and off, everybody could have done it. So there was like no one solution or there was no one silver bullet. It always has to be a combination of different solutions coming together to provide the scale and the trade-offs that are very specific to your application. And so what were some of those trade-offs that the Twitter was negotiating that enabled them to take that big step forward? One of them would be it's a problem of, as I said before, small rights. Mm -hmm. Like you're commenting like you, it's like, I think it was like 140 characters at the time. Yeah, right. Yeah, 140 characters. Like, so your whole message has to be in 140 characters. Turns out a lot of humans can, wanted to opine on everything in 140 characters. So, you, so imagine that you're trying to store tiny amounts of information but you're trying to store a lot of them. And then you're trying to create a timeline out of them. Like if you're, if Google is indexing pages, those pages are blog sized or longer pages. So you, for each URL, you have a lot of text to look at and to index. But for each tweet, you have a URL and then like 140 characters. Right. But now you have like too many of them. So you need a, needed a different solution on how to store them, how to index them, how to create a timeline out of 
those tiny tweets uh, all of this thing all of these things had to be reimagined that hadn't happened before